I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dykers, retired. Throughout the war, the Japanese were intent upon capturing one of our submarines to find out what new devices allowed our submariners to take such a heavy toll of their shipping. In May of 1943, the Japanese fleet was suddenly presented with just such an opportunity, and the Krivali was the submarine they had within their grasp. The story of the battle for this submarine begins back in Perth, West Australia, when the Admiral assigned the Krivali a new and dangerous patrol area. The story starts in early April 1944 in Darwin, Australia, with the USS Krivali resting against the pilings of her Darwin Wharf. Two veteran members of her crew had just been granted liberty ashore. Torpedoman Edward Coates and Torpedoman Frank Herndon. The officer of the deck was the Krivali's executive officer, Lieutenant William J. Rue, a fine officer and intelligent submariner. But he had no way of knowing what would happen before the day was out. Six thousand miles from the nearest hillbilly, what do they play? Western music. You figure kind of funny. That ain't all that's funny, Eddie. Yeah, I know. Me. You I can buy. I'm talking about your idea of relaxing. The facts of life, boy. Most guys, they finish a long patrol. They want to go out and howl a little, you know. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm just a wet blanket then. This does it for me. Just sitting? Sitting. Sometimes I don't read you, Dad. You're a lot of men in a torpedo room, but it's sure you... Like I told you before, you're not my nurse. You want to go someplace, don't let me ruin it for no, you. No, no, you ain't ruining anything. It's... Well, what I mean is take Karnofsky there. You think he knows anybody in a little place like Darwin? Not a soul. But he don't just sit, he knows how to live it up. Four bits says he comes off for the day. No bet. Love Frank. I, I, I like to sit around and take it easy. Let the other guys do the running around. Like in Fremantle, like in Brisbane. Like that. But that doesn't mean you have to. Well, the underwater Errol Flynn. You make out? You ever know me not to buy? Well, if we took your word for it, no. Funny. Well, just don't sit there. She could dig up a couple of friends. Come on, I don't hear anything. No, I guess we'll just stay put. Frank, you don't uh, have Bye, Karnofsky. What are you waiting for? Boy, I'd try to do a guy a favor. Frank, what'd you want to do that for? Uh, coffee's cold. I'll get some more. That gal's swamped. Well, you don't mind, do you, buddy? Six times in a row for the same tune gets a little rough. You don't like it in here, chum. Why don't you offer it? My money's as good as yours. You don't like my taste in music, eh? Like to do something about it, would you? We're out of line, mister. Knock it off. Two coffee. Now try to tell me that was an accident. You know it was. You're a liar, Yank. This is what happens to liars. Eddie, come on, help me. Several versions of this fight. The bar owner claims Herndon started it. But Herndon and a couple of customers claim he didn't. And Coates here says he didn't. He was another eyewitness. At least at the beginning of it. Uh, that's right, sir. It wasn't Herndon's fault. Well, the bar owner's probably trying to protect his steady customers. I'm 
going to turn Herndon over to you. Your responsibility. Thanks. Let's go. Twenty-four hours later, the USS Crivalli had left the docks of Darwin well behind. Her destination, the coastal waters north of Borneo. The Crivalli skipper on this, her third war patrol, was Lieutenant Commander Frank D. Walker from Wyoming, Ohio. An extremely well-liked captain, his ability was second to none, nor his concern for his men. Permission to come on the bridge, Captain? Granted. I'm ready to take over the watch again, sir. Did you check those Borneo coastal charts? It's a rough area. An important area. The Japanese have been taking a lot of oil out of Borneo. There'll be plenty of hunting. The hard way, Captain. Those tankers will be hugging a coastline where it's real shallow. That's the point. The Admiral wants those tankers forced away from the shoreline into deep water so our shots can get a crack at them. I know it sounds like the hard way, but it'll pay off with interest. We'll be working in less than 150 feet of water just to get that shot at them. Just so we get that shot. I'll relieve you now, sir. Oh, uh, Bill. Yes, sir? Some kind of a beef going on below? What makes you think that, sir? A reaction, a feeling? Nothing, sir. It's just a little disagreement between a couple of torpedoes. Good. It's going to be rough enough outside the ship. Yes, sir. your play. You in a rush? Look, Herndon, what goes with you and Coates? What was the beef all about? Still your play. Okay, so you brush me off. Do you think you can hide a thing like that? The whole ship knows by now. Karnowski. How could they miss it? Two guys are buddy-buddy for over a year. Now they don't even speak. Why? Are you going to play or not? Hi. Well, I've had enough. I'm going to get some air. Ernest, I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. This thing between you and Coat, it's gone far enough. Well? We're just not speaking, sir. Every man aboard ship knows a beef when he sees one, from the captain on down. I want a happy ship, Herndon. This sort of thing doesn't help. Yes, sir. Herndon, did you ever stop to think how much guts it took for Coast to tell me he ran out on you that day in Darwin? Did you? But he did run, sir, didn't he? You don't have to worry about it, sir. No one will ever know what happened. Not from me, sir. The Crivalli had by now reached its assigned area of patrol off the Borneo coast. In the control room, Captain Frank Walker went over charts of the dangerous waters with his executive officer. And in the sick bay, pharmacist mate Leon Cully attended to a matter on a smaller scale. Have you ever made pharmacist mate? Boy, you got a touch like a blackjack, Cully. So learn to use a wrench right. You're more dangerous than the Japanese. Hey, uh, what's the latest with the happiness boys? Hernan and Coates? Psh, still the same. You know, I never quit, Stan, mysteries. I'd give a month's pay to know what's behind all of this. You know, I... What? Wait a minute. They were buddy-buddy when I left the cafe. Then I heard there was a fight in the joint, and Herna comes back all banged up. Coats, he don't even have a scratch. I just wonder. Yeah, stow it, Karnowski. The war's outside the ship. I told you. I can't stand mysteries. There's a long shelf here, about 15 miles out to sea. You'll probably have to go in over it. Come on, Herndon. 
You can trust me. Get away from me, Konofsky. Was that how it was? Coach, take a powder when the fight started? You can tell me, Herndon. It's none of your business. Now forget it. So it was that way. Who would have figured it? Coats. Yellow. There won't be much of a chance slipping back into deep waters if we get boxed in by anti-submarine vessels. Well, yeah, we'll worry about that when we Captain, get... to the bridge. Captain, to the bridge. What's up, Walt? Smoke on the horizon, Captain. Air the bridge! Secure, sir. Take her down to 60 feet. Steady to go. Steady she goes. Down scope. Big convoy coming up to the south. Oil tankers? Big ones hugging the coastline. We'll have to go in the shallow water like we figured. Big patrolling escort? It looks like a convention. Make radial torpedo tubes. Make radial torpedo tubes? The look. Ain't you got enough to do? Just thinking. You know, it might get real rough real quick. So? It's bad enough for everyone else. But I wonder what it's like for a guy who's yellow. yards. Now Periscope. Angle on the bow, 50 starboard. Set. All torpedo tubes ready. Stand by. Bill. That's the second ship in the column. What's your guess? Like a floating dry dock to me. Mm. Sinking that in that shallow water is a waste. That tanker with her, I want. It's the biggest tanker I've ever seen. Two stacks aft. She's tremendous. Up periscope. Big. She's as big as an island. Like that, Skipper? That's her. The Tona Maru, huh? Right. That's 20,000 tons. Converted whaler. That's a lot of oil. And I want it. Take her down, emergency! Destroyer heading right at us. Flood negative. 15 degree, down bubble. Level off at 100 feet. Turn on your speaker. Directly over, Skip. Think she knows we're here? That's her problem. I want that tanker. 100 feet. Take her up to 60 feet. Sixty feet. Up periscope. Down. 
Don't see coming. Range. Mark. 1400 yards. Set. Fire. Bombing our truck feet away. They know about us now. They really know about us now. Haven't hit a midships, middle of target. Haven't thrown a bow off. Commence torpedo reload. Belay the reload. The depth charges were dropping in pattern now. And the pinging of the sound gear told Captain Walker that many vessels were on the surface above. Too many for reasonable chance of escape to the open sea. The commanding officer considered his position. Lack of depth was a definite handicap, and the Crevalli was getting heavy from water leaking in. With no other possible choice, Captain Walker bottomed the Crevalli in the mud and Carl at a depth of 174 feet. It was time for the most nerve-wracking period of all, the game of waiting. How long is the old man going to sit down here? Why don't you ask him? That's the trouble with the Navy. Everybody's a comic. Nobody's a straight man. You know, for a guy who's chickened out, your ex-buddy's taking a pretty... Why don't you shut up, Kronofsky? For more than an hour, the men waited in silence, hearing the pinging of the enemy vessels above, and hoping to sell the enemy the idea that the Crevalli had been sunk. The Japanese were taking no chances. They had located Crevalli and wanted to move her before water seeping into all of her compartments made her too heavy. The first step was to attach a line, and they lost no time in getting started. Peter room reports loud noises. They say it sounds like someone walking on deck. Captain, you don't think that... Better take a look through the boat, Bill. Let's just hope it is inside. It's not anybody aboard, Captain. They've heard it all over the ship. Then I guess we know what it is. The easy for them to slide a depth charge down once they hook on to us. I think they want more than that. You mean drag us up? Be a big catch. U.S. sub, all that secret gear. Give them a lot of answers. Get ready to destroy all their secret matter and an axe to smash sonar and radar. He's dragging us. Let him have his way for the time being. how heavy a cable he's got on us. We'll find out just as soon as he gives us the right moment. 180 feet, at least he's pulling us into deep water. Let's hope he keeps doing it. Yeah. 
Ready? Religious. Religious. Metal. Wallet. Please. Get it. We can use all the help. This is... What's the depth now? 195. Captain. Not yet. We'll only have one try. Better be the right one. We'll still wait. Passed out. Broken shoulder. With caved in ribs. What kind of pain to put an elephant out. I heard what he did for you. No guts? Man, you gotta be kidding. What's the clipping? About a guy that court freed. A guy that got pushed into a bar fight, hit back, and accidentally blinded a guy. Him? No wonder he wouldn't throw a punch. Who would? I got a lot of apologizing to do when he comes out of this. Yep. 200 feet. Let's see how good a hole he has. All ahead, flank. All ahead, flank. Cable. All ahead, pull. I'd love to see that skipper's face when he sees the end of his cable. Yeah, that's his problem. Ours is to put distance between us. thinking about that Japanese skipper. He's going to be a real mad fellow about now. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to see the look on his face? I was thinking about happy fellas. 72 of them right here. Yes, sir. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. I'm very pleased to present to you the executive officer of the USS Crevalli on this patrol, Commander W.J. Rue, United States Navy. Bill, it's good to see you. Did the Crevalli succeed in driving the Japanese convoys back into deep water? Very effectively, Admiral. But there were other subs who helped. They did the same sort of shallow water patrols during that period. I imagine that the sinking of the Tonan Maru was the clincher. Must have been. From then on, the Japanese convoys plowed down the middle of the ocean. And that's when we shifted over to Wolfpack-style warfare. That's right. It was sure a nice, comfortable feeling on our next patrol, prowling the deepest part of the ocean in company with two other submarines. I don't remember it being comfortable, but it was profitable. And the Crevalli gets a lot of credit for giving the Wolfpacks plenty of sea room. Thank you, Admiral. Awfully nice, Bill. Be with us again when the Silent Service brings you another exciting submarine story. <laughs>